Welcome everyone to COVID-19 Clinical Rounds. I'm James Gertson. I'm a family physician here in Thunder Bay, the Associate Dean of CPD at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. And uh, we have a great presentation with a number of, pre number of presenters from across the North. So uh, hope everyone is ready to enjoy a, a very informative and educational presentation. Before we start, I just want to show you uh, a little bit about the COVID-19 rounds website, which is uh, the website you use to come in today. Um, if you'll note here that there's an evaluation link that we'd encourage you to complete once you have uh, finished uh, viewing our session today. We really appreciate your feedback, which provides important information to us and also to our presenters. On the COVID-19 rounds page, you'll notice this button called clinical resources. If you hit that button and you hit again, the clinical resources website button, it will bring you to our awesome clinical resources. And on this uh, page in particular, you'll see a case status for Northern Ontario. So as of this morning, uh, we've had 296 cases in uh, Northern Ontario since the start of the pandemic. Of importance, there are only 11 active cases in Northern Ontario. And of importance, the number of cases in Northern Ontario has only gone up by two over the last week. So last week, we had a total of 294 cases, and we now have a total of 296 cases. As you can see, the vast majority of the cases have resolved, so we only have 11 active cases. If we look at Tamiskamane, a total of 18 cases, no changes from last week. Thunder Bay, a total of 81 cases, one active, no changes from last week. Sudbury, 64 cases with no active cases, no change from last week. Uh, Porcupine, which is uh, the Timmins area, 65 cases, two active, no changes. And it's only been an increase of one case in Algoma, which is Sudbury, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, and one case in Northern Bay, North, North Bay. So as you can uh, see very clearly, our case status in Northern Ontario is very stable, and I think that's uh, that's the, the rationale, the reason that you are hearing uh, requests that Northern Ontario, uh, and in particular Northwestern and Northeastern Ontario, be considered uh, for a different uh, return to opening up uh, when comparing to uh, Toronto. I'm just going to... Uh, out from this and I'd like to now uh, move on to a few uh, just uh, key, key pieces of information for you. So again, a reminder for you to mute your audio throughout the presentation. Our uh, COVID-19 rounds committee has no conflicts of interest to declare. And as our knowledge of COVID-19 is rapidly changing, our presenters will be giving you the best available information. In addition, uh, questions throughout today's presentation will be very much appreciated, and you can use the WebEx chat to do that. Uh, this will allow us to forward the questions to our moderator and then to our panel. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. It's uh, Dr. Laura Lee McGregor. Uh, Laura Lee is a Anishinaabe from the Whitefish First River First Nations. She's an assistant professor at NOSM, and her research and teaching focuses on Indigenous people's health. Let me turn it over to you now, uh, Laura Lee, to uh, introduce our session and our presenters. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Ani Bojo, Laura Lee McGregor, Dishnikaz, Wagas, Ginnagad, and Donjaba. I'd like to acknowledge that NOSM's wider campus of Northern Ontario is on the traditional lands of First Nations people and is home to the Metis. The school also respectfully acknowledges that the medical school building at Laurentian University is located on the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory and is the traditional territory of the Atikmek Shing Anishinaabek. The medical school building at Lakehead University is on the Robinson Superior Treaty Territory, and Thunder Bay is the traditional territory of the Fort William First Nation. Before turning it over to our guest presenters, I'm going to provide a brief overview about Indigenous peoples and COVID-19. 
So we know that Indigenous populations are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19 because of high rates of pre-existing health conditions such as COPD, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and smoking. Furthermore, social determinants such as access to clean water, overcrowded housing, mold, food insecurity, and limited access to health resources exacerbates the risks of contracting and spreading COVID-19. The First Nations Information Governance Centre recently published a report about this, and it's available. I'll, I'll uh, give that information to James and he can um, post it on the resource page. I'd also, um, so James at the start gave some statistics on um, the number of cases of COVID-19 in Northern Ontario. And I'm just going to do a little bit about um, the number of cases across Canada. So according to the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Indigenous Services Canada, as of yesterday, there were 214 confirmed cases of COVID-19 reported in First Nations across Canada. Um, for Ontario, the Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Sciences has also been tracking COVID-19 cases for the Chiefs of Ontario. And as of May 27th, there have been 49 cases um, on reserve and 49 off reserve. And unfortunately, there have been four deaths due to COVID-19, two on reserve and two off reserve. Indigenous people who are living in urban areas are also vulnerable to the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19. And there's a recent Statistics Canada report that draws upon data from the 2017 Aboriginal People Survey that states that 24% of Indigenous people who live in urban areas are financially vulnerable and 38% experience food insecurity. And so we know that um, these, um, particularly in these economically unstable times, has a big impact on people. Um, I do want to also mention that um, First Nations have been responding to COVID-19 in various ways. So, for example, updating and enacting pandemic emergency preparedness plans, restricting access into and out of First Nations, except for developing uh, public health policies and public education campaigns, as well as lobbying the federal government for PPE. Um, I'd like to um, introduce our speakers and to give us insight into the experience of the remote First Nation of Oh boy, I'm going to mess this up. <laughs> Yeva Matung. We have two guest speakers, uh, Dr. Claudette Chase and Dr. Rebecca Nekoe. Dr. Chase began a family medicine practice in Sioux Lookout in 1994. She has maintained a comprehensive practice and currently visits the remote community of Yeba Matung one, one week a month. She's the site director for the remote First Nations residency stream at NOSM. And she is also part of the Anishinaabeaski Nation's COVID-19 emergency response team and is on the subcommittee for mental health and addictions. Dr. Rebecca Nekoe is a proud Indigenous woman from Northwestern Ontario. Her father is Cree from Fox Lake First Nation and her mother is Ojibwe from Yebamatong Yeb First Nation. She is a graduate of NOSM's class of 2013 and she did a rural family medicine residency at the University of Alberta in 2015. <clears throat> After residency, she has served First Nation communities as a comprehensive family physician working out of Sioux Lookout. She currently locums and continues to serve First Nation communities all while traveling every chance she gets. And Dr. Nekaway is also a learning advocate for students, residents, and faculty at NOSM. Following their presentation, we will ask Dr. Kona Williams to provide her reflections and then open up the forum for questions. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Claudette Chase and Dr. Nekoe. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Claudette Chase and Becky and I are gonna sort of tag team through this presentation. And 
um, because we both like stories, we're going to start with the story of um, how I got the call on a Sunday afternoon that I wasn't even working for the first um, confirmed case in Yabmatung or EFN, Yabmatung First Nation is the easy way to say it. And um, I've been the family doctor for that community for 12 years and have known many of the community members for um, prior to 1994 when I was a Northern nurse and actually did a rotation there as an outpost nurse. But um, so long connections. And like many of you, when I hear statistics, I, I see faces. So I got a call from the acting nurse in charge who um, had begrudgingly taken the role when the permanent guy was off on a well-deserved break. And um, she got to be the one in the midst of this firestorm. And she had tried to call um, the regional phones doctor um, from our practice who covers, but they were extremely busy and she wasn't able to get through. And so as a default, she called me. And in a way, I think that worked out better because I know the community and know what resources are there. And so we tried to act as quickly as possible in terms of deciding who was at risk, was the person stable, what, what public health measures needed to be implemented urgently. And part of the story that is a thread throughout is the legacy of colonial, one of the many legacies of colonialism in remote First Nations is that the services are all, all answer to different people. So I work as an independent contractor to Suluka Regional Physician Services Incorporated or SLRPC as we fondly call it. And the band employees work for the First Nation and the nurses work for the most part for ISC, although many of them are agency nurses that come in and out. And it just so happened at this time, other than the nurse in charge, all the nurses were agency nurses. So there was no one who really understood or knew the community. So I made a bunch of suggestions that did not go along with what were the current public health recommendations, but which at an instinctive level, I knew would matter to the community and would make them feel safer, which was that all contacts immediately be tested, not just that they would have the, certainly have the inquiry about symptoms, but that they would be tested. That the nurse who thought she was seeing someone for a swollen lip in the middle of the night, so hadn't put on precautions, and, and only when he coughed did she start doing an inquiry and found out that in fact he had been very sick, had been in Thunder Bay, had been seen in the eMERGE in Thunder Bay and treated for pneumonia. Unfortunately, not instructed on how to return to a remote First Nations with safe public health measures like wearing a mask on the plane, that there had been several people on the plane with him traveling, going to two different communities. So as I'm hearing this, I, I must admit to a certain level of panic at how quickly things can spread and how quickly things can get out of hand and worked very hard to let my practice know, to let the doctor for the other community that was involved know so that he could get on top of things and to get the testing done. Um, one of Becky has many brilliant ideas, and one of the one of them was to start what we call now our morning huddle, and we we phoned in, we invited community members, we tried to strategize, and she'll tell you more about that later. But at the next, when we had our first one that involved um, Indigenous Services Canada, I found out that none of the testing I had ordered had been done that ISC who was trying to coordinate the public health response from Ottawa by delegating the work of public health to nurses in the community who were understaffed and overrun with acute care, um, that in fact, almost nothing had been done. And 
I guess one of the reasons Becky and I present together is a shared propensity for tears. But this was extremely, this was a very hard point for me because I, when I think of, you know, we talk in abstract about elders being at risk, but I pictured faces and names and stories and the impact on their families and a deep knowledge that at that time, Fort Hope could only give oxygen. We had six tanks of oxygen, and, but we only have three of the converters that you put on the tanks. So as many of you know, one of the first treatments for people who are getting sicker with COVID is to give them oxygen. And if even half of the people contacted by the various people who had not been contained were infected, it would have been more than three people was my worry. So there was a lot of anxiety and panic and, um, but working with the community seemed to be the answer. So um, I spent about three and a half hours that Sunday afternoon putting into place what I thought were measures that would be protective that would help to decrease the community's overall anxiety. And like I said, by Monday afternoon and definitely Tuesday morning, I was aware that almost none of them had been done, except for that the, the primary case was in isolation, but even his contacts who had given him a ride back from the nursing station the night he was swabbed, who had, um, you know, it, it, there, it kept coming out, oh, well, actually it wasn't just this guy, his girlfriend was also in the truck. And so the, if you were making a movie about what not to do in a public health <laughs> epidemic, we'd win the prize because, you know, and some of it was from lack of knowledge. A lot of it was lack of a coordinated effort and too many, too many cooks and no clear line of authority. So I think going forward, Indigenous services, I mean, Indigenous peoples in our area have taken some really important strategic steps. Um, right now, the Sioux Lookup First Nations Health Authority has had the role that Ottawa would traditionally have for contact tracing transferred for them for the duration of the COVID-19 epidemic. And that's a positive that has come out of this. And um, I think in terms of what I wanted to say about that was that that was how the initial case presented. That was the initial reactions. And I wanted to just bring home the point that I think I share with many of you that if you look after seniors in long term care homes, when the news is talking abstractly about how, how difficult this has been, you undoubtedly are seeing the faces of the patients that you worry about. And, um, for me, opportunities like this are, are very important for that shared experience. And I want to thank you for being willing to listen to us present. And now I'd like to hand over to Becky, who will get into more of the nitty gritty of what, what's come of this. Thank you so much, Claudette. Um, and thank you for Nazem for having us at the COVID-19 rounds. And it's always a privilege working and presenting alongside Claudette. So thank you. Um, one thing I do want to disclose is that we are not speaking on behalf of the community. We are speaking um, to our own personal experiences and perspectives. And that we also speak with the utmost gratitude and respect for EFN. First slide, please, James. Becky, can, sorry, can I interrupt? Can you also just at this point mention, which I meant to mention, that the chief gave us explicit permission to present? Yes, he did. And that is later in my presentation. So I'm putting up a few photos of Iabamatung First Nation or EFN so you can get a sense of it. Uh, for those calling in, what I am showing is a small remote community in a grid like pattern. Uh, surrounded by beautiful lakes and forests. There is a large unpaved airstrip beside the community and you can see a road leading out, but it's not necessarily going very far. 
um, is going to the community dump and as well to the best blueberry picking patches and the first ever golf course on a remote reserve. Now, I heard Nishkandiga and Wanaman have since followed suit and also have some little golf courses there. But I'm gonna claim it for EFM that we had the first. <laughs> um, so before I start, um, I, as Claudette has mentioned, I wanna paint a picture of what life is like in Fort Hope because I want to do this because I realize that some people have never visited a remote First Nation before let alone provided medical services there. I'm hoping that through these photos, you can see what it looks like so you can imagine it because I want it to feel like a real place for you um, because ultimately we want you to care about it. And perhaps one day you will come up and work with us there. So EFN is where my mother and her family are from. This is where my late Shomish and Gogo grew up, arrived raised seven children, saw multiple grandchildren grow up, including myself, and many families continue to make their home there. My aunts, uncles, and cousins reside there, and I grew up playing on these shores during summer visits, and I have stayed in these homes for many Christmases. Uh, the people choose to live here because their history and ancestors are tied to these lands. The Current chief and his family are close friends to my parents and I've known them my whole life. And we thank Chief Yesno for allowing us to discuss with the, to discuss the community and our experiences open with you today, both the good and the bad. Uh, I will begin with the challenges that the community faces on a regular basis and how COVID-19 intensifies them. It will paint a grim picture, but near the end of our presentation, we will discuss the strengths of the community and the positive aspects that have come out from this pandemic so far, and so many more are still coming forward. So Iabamatang is situated on the North Shore of Ebimit Lake, as you can see by the photo there. Um, it feeds into the Albany River and is a former Hudson Bay trading post, and treaties were signed here. Um, back, dating back to 1929. They are part of the Ojibwe Nation, and the predominant languages are Ojibwe and English. So next slide, please, James. This shows a map of Northwestern Ontario and where the community is located. It is 360 kilometers north of Thunder Bay, as the geese fly, and there is no road access except in a few months during the winter when the ice roads are open. Um, travel time on these ice roads can range from 11 to 14 hours, conditions dependent. So it is quite remote. When a physician traveler books my flights, um, I often see the cost of my return flight from Thunder Bay is $800 to $900 a ticket. So that kind of money could get me to Europe and back. Um, so remoteness is a double-edged sword for the community as it isolates them from possible spread of COVID-19, but it also isolates them from essential health services, which are so easily accessible to us in places like Thunder Bay. There is a sole nursing station, which operates as a clinic in an emergency department, and it has four to six nurses depending on staffing and the physicians who visit one to two weeks out of the month. And lately those um, physician visits have been ramped up and extended. So for myself, I was up in the community in April for eight days. Usually our stints are five days. Um, and then recently I spent um, 15 days up north. So on reserve, there are approximately 1600 BAM members and even more off reserve, largely located in Thunder Bay or Sulacout. And the on reserve band members are residing in approximately 260 homes. So that's an average of six people per household. And in some small cases, there could be only one or two people living in a home, but on the other more common end of the spectrum, there could be 10 or 11. And in an extreme case, we have heard that there were 18 people in one home. And these aren't large homes, like they are about a thousand square feet. Um, so 
in terms of overcrowding, as we all know, um, the, the rapid spread of COVID-19 within a household is a real concern. And Chief Yesno wrote a letter to the government explaining the, um, more assistance. And Claudette and I found out as well when we were trying to recommend self-isolation for uh, patients who have been swabbed for typical symptoms of COVID-19, but could have been related to their, you know, usual COPD or CHF or congestive heart failure. Um, when we were trying to ask them to self-isolate and waiting for the swabs to come back, uh, we found out that some elders were living in living rooms and with six other family members. So it was almost impossible for them to, to do that. So Chief Yesno also um, was requesting 84 houses immediately for their community members to try to offload this overcrowding. Um, and they were also requesting from the government 120 home unit renovations at a minimum. So that's almost half the homes needing serious maintenance issues for issues like mold. Um, the community has been under a boil water advisory for over 18 years, despite a state of the art water plant that has been recently built, but is still working out the kinks. And a handful of homes do not have running water and sewage. Again, a fact Dr. Chase and I found out the hard way when we were telling a close contact of the COVID-19 patient to quarantine and keep up good public health measures. Meanwhile, they didn't have running water to wash their hands as we were recommending. And I'll just briefly mention the high cost of food and resources like fuel in the North. Um, I asked my cousins the other day how much milk is going for up there, and they told me a four liter jug of milk costs fifteen dollars, and a one liter one liter of gas is costing two dollars and twenty cents, despite the lower you know offered price in the rest of the province. And as Laura Lee mentioned earlier, our patients are some of the most vulnerable people in Canada and community members struggle with health issues such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, mental health and addictions, and are some of the highest rates in Canada. But of course, those illnesses aren't just um, like, um, they, they go on beyond those that I mentioned. So to provide medical care, the community has a government run nursing station and community based health and social services programs. There's no pharmacy on site. Medications get filled at a pharmacy in Sula couch and then get flown up. The nurses, the nursing station does stock some essential commonly used medications and supplies. And this includes uh, a trauma room with a limited supply of oxygen tanks as Dr. Chase mentioned. So from the nursing station and medical side of things, the community relies on nurses and physicians coming up from outside the community to provide essential services. So we are potential vectors. And this also extends to the um, Nishinaabe ASCII police services or NAPS and their police officers. So majority of the nurses are coming from Southern Ontario where COVID-19 cases are high and there's always a risk of being a vector for the virus. And I know myself and Dr. Chase have experienced anxiety and concerns about possibly being vectors from Thunder Bay. Uh, then there is the issue of governance and jurisdictions that have hamper, hampered rapid action. So for example, as Dr. Chase was mentioning, the community nurses, um, the community nursing station is ran by Health Canada or now known as ISC, which is Indigenous Services Canada. And the nursing staff, including the nurse in charge, are largely hired and directed by ISC. Other nurses are hired by private agencies. Uh, meanwhile, Dr. Chase and I are private contractors hired by a Sulacout based organization. So there are many players here working with different policies, have different training, and we do not share an emergency or, sorry, electronic medical record or EMR. So we rely also on scheduled flights with airlines such as Wasea or Northstar 
coming in and out of the community to transport patients for elective appointments, visits with specialists, or tests and procedures that need to be done at the Thunder Bay or Sulacau hospitals. And this is also how we would send patients out to get assessed on a more urgent basis. And if it is obvious that it is life or limb and they can't safely be transported on a scheduled flight, we would then do a medevac where Orange, our provincial area ambulance, would come up to the community and bring them to a hospital. Uh, labs, such as like your usual CBC, lights, chemistry, um, urine cultures, things like that, are also sent out on these scheduled flights to the Sulakaut Minoyawan Health Center to be analyzed. And these flights used to come daily, if not twice a day. And now due to COVID-19 and the travel restrictions, these flights are only coming twice a week and can be very variable. And we actually unfortunately had an experience when I was up there last week where one of these scheduled flights was supposed to come on Tuesday. And so we had patients come in Monday and Tuesday to try to get all this blood work done that needs to be done to monitor their usual chronic diseases. And the flight was just canceled. And so all this blood work, all this work that had been done, which was also going to direct care, um, had to be redone and had to be delayed by two or three days. Um, so now also with COVID-19, the, these limited um, flights are impacting when we can actually send out our COVID swabs and also get the results back in a timely manner. And sometimes they are only good for 48 hours after they've been tested. And so they have, we have fortunately not had the issue yet, but there's always the risk that they could be rejected by the lab and need to be repeated. And um, one of, again, one of the strengths that we'll talk to later that the community has is that they paid for a chartered flight to take the swabs of the primary contact of the COVID-19 case to Sulacout to be tested before they expired. So it's great to see this kind of, um, you know, action by the band and what they have to do beyond what um, Indigenous Services Canada and the other um, agencies have provided. Um, it's just great to see that kind of self-determination. So as many clinics in Ontario were moving to virtual care, Dr. Chase and I found this to be a great challenge. Uh, many of our patients do not have telephones. And I was like, oh, okay, that's only going to be like a handful of patients. But it was a lot more than I was anticipating. Um, one update, and I'm sure the numbers have improved, but when we were doing our morning huddles, um, one of the emergency response team members' goal was to try to track down as many phone numbers as they could. And as I said, out of 1,600 patients, 260 households, they only got a hold of 160 uh, numbers. So quite um, a lot of them were lacking phones. So we would have like 12 patients on our list to call and nine only had numbers listed. And then of those nine, only six were actually in service. So this in severely impacts the number of patients that we could see virtually. And the internet is inadequate and can, and can be largely unreliable. So providing virtual appointments by online platforms onto patients' home laptops or phones was not something that we could do. And there was only one OTN or Ontario Telemedicine Network station, which allows video conferencing for patients. But thankfully that was being used by specialists. Another issue uh, affecting the OTN is that the community generator has occasional power outages and resetting the machine can take a long process. Um, a psychiatrist and I found this out the hard way when we were trying to get a patient urgently assessed. So in order to reach the community members who don't have telephones, um, Dr. Chase and I have been doing weekly radio shows by telephone. Uh, to reach the community and give them information on COVID-19 and to answer any questions or concerns they might have related to it. 
Um, we also have been using it as a platform to approach difficult conversations such as advanced care planning and also talk about funeral restrictions. And this is one of the most reliable ways to reach each household. Um, so I hope this gives you an idea of the logistical hardships in EFN and how the pandemic exacerbates them. But each community is different and unique. So I'm also sure, um, so we can't really paint, you know, all the communities with this broad brush. Um, I'm also sure there are more that we could speak to. I will stop there. And if there are any questions, we can happily answer them at the end. So Dr. Chase will now talk about our roles as physicians in the community and how we have been offering our support to the community. Well, that you're on mute. This wasn't my 1,000th presentation. You could understand why I still get that wrong. Anyway, sorry guys. Um, I was starting to say, I was brought up in a household where my parents talked a lot about the self-determination, the rights to self-determination of oppressed peoples. Um, and as I got older and began working with indigenous people, I've been taught a lot along the line about how to be respectful and how to undo my bossy white woman ways of wanting to take over most conversations, a struggle I am still working on. But one of the things that helped me make this workable and part of my everyday life was, was studying and reading more about allyship, which was a concept that I, um, I, it was really during the Black Lives Matters um, a period that when that I started understanding it. And Dr. Neckaway and I had prepared a presentation for SRPC on allyship. And I think in a, a strange way, it was timely in terms of guiding my own behaviors through this pandemic. Um, so the, the definition that we used um, which is taken from PeerNet BC, is that allyship begins when a person of privilege seeks to support a marginalized individual or group. It is a practice of unlearning and relearning and is a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized individuals or groups. And there's a lot of things it's not. It's not an identity. It's not self-defined. I don't get to wander around and say, oh, I'm an all, I look at me. And it must be recognized by the people we're seeking to support. And some of it um, is, you know, there's parts that all of us on this line can do of transferring the benefits of our privilege to those who lack it. It's acknowledging that while you might've had a very hard life and have a ton of pain, conversation around allyship isn't about you. and to try to stand up even when you feel scared. So I shared with you all that certainly at the beginning of this, I had a lot of fear, but I also have a relationship for the most part with trust. I mean, there are people as in any community who would not, would be upset with me, but um, and knowing that people would want the testing. And in fact, that became very clear the first day that what was seen a reluctance to test that was actually based on national and provincial guidelines was being interpreted by the community and with great reason as an unwillingness to spend the money, as an unwillingness to use the tests up. And to me, this should have been anticipated. And because the risk was higher, the capacity to to diagnose more, to swab more, all of those things should have been stepped up a lot more quickly than they were. So to me, this is a very concrete example of how one can be an ally because your first instinct is to say, well, we have provincial guidelines on this and we should just apply the guidelines. But, but 
there is a long history of outside communities telling indigenous communities, don't worry, we know what's best for you. And we all know how well that's not worked out. So it behooves us to find different ways of acting and of behaving in our actions. And so in this example, um, we opted to follow and work with the community to come up with a directive, a medical directive, and we had great support in this from Dr. Natalie Bocking, who's the public health physician working with SLIFNA, um, to come up with a directive that really worked at the community level, did not overwhelm labs by testing people that it made no sense, but tested significant contacts because we all understood that because of the the, the virtual impossibility of self-isolating in most of the houses that if there if there was a case that was not was transmissible it would be very frightening how quickly it would go and that the community had to dis make decisions on um, guidelines for the whole community and they needed information to do this so I can say that what we used as guidelines eventually became the guidelines for the whole province. And that was under the direction of the indigenous leadership. And so sometimes it, you might be called upon. I mean, I, I freely say there are things that, you know, I have ethical lines and times where I would say, no, I can't participate in that. To me, this is was not an example. This was certainly not a hill to die on. It was a hill in which to do everything we could to support a community that was struggling with tremendous anxiety and fear. And this is something completely unknown to them. And when um, Dr. Nekwe gets into the part talking about all the things the community did, just imagine if you'd grown up and knew everybody in this community of 1600 and had lots of relations there, how frightening it would be to think of this awful invader of COVID-19 and yet to, in the context of that fear, to be able to come up with a response. And the, I, the other thing I meant to mention in the first part, but I'll add in here, um, that for me, this opportunity to support from afar, because I was meant to be going up the Monday, I got a call on the Sunday, and Monday I was going for what was meant to be my final visit as the comprehensive doctor to the community, because I'm 66 years old. And so it was going to be part of a, a retirement. And I wasn't, you know, I had just had surgery, and for many reasons, it didn't make medical sense for me to go. And so I had to cancel that trip and have been left in this limbo. But um, so it, it's part of the story for me as well. And having this opportunity to be a support and at times to use my privilege. So when things the community wanted weren't happening, I could say, well, excuse me, I'm a physician and I gave what was a reasonable order. And if it was not followed, then I need to have someone feed that back to me. And I did that not to be like to lord it over nursing, but to to break through the path, the the um the different silos we were in, and to say, look, we're all working on this together, and we have to communicate openly and talk to each other. Um, the other thing that has really helped us in our um, in working towards being better allies is we work with a group, a remarkable group of physicians referred to as the Northern Practice and Su Lookout, who um, share share our commitment to social justice, who and that has also strengthened our ability to do some of this work. I imagine doing it in isolation would be extremely hard. So I'm gonna hand it back to Dr. Nekaway. We want, we're very interested in your comments and questions. Um, and she's going to go over some of the, the positive takeaways from this experience. And there are many, and they're very deep and, and real. So thanks again for your attention. Thanks, Claudette.
Um, yeah, one thing I want to say is like the reason that we do this work because it is not easy work. You know, we have to leave our homes, we have to um, stay at accommodations that aren't our own. And, um, but the reason why we do it is because it brings such great meaning and purpose to our lives and it enriches us. And um, like the community members are some of the most resilient, strong, and good humored people that we know. And like my patient encounters are some of the best that I've had. And um, they live with their unique challenges, but they also rise to meet them and they inspire us to show up as our best selves for them. And I'm sure I could speak for our Northern practice colleagues in that sentiment as well. So, um, so for Hope as a community, they responded quite um, well to the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of restricting travel. They closed their elementary school. They, you know, canceled community events and workshops and they developed a pandemic plan. They declared a state of emergency and they imposed curfews to discourage people from, you know, gathering. And they um, also closed their grocery stores. They have two. And then once, you know, the initial concern of possible spread from the COVID-19 case um, lifted because all the swabs were coming back negative, um, they decided to, you know, open up with some uh, precautions, like limiting the number of people in the store at a time, which of course has had its challenges as well. Um, they also were arranging hampers for the community band members who weren't living in Fort Hope, but also for the ones in Fort Hope too. Um, I, uh, for myself personally, um, and I know I can probably speak to Claudette, is the co collegiality and teamwork that we've experienced during this time has just been a huge positive. And it was like something that I always had, like I always knew Claudette had my back and our colleagues did too, but it was probably something that I took for granted. And during this time, it has just made me appreciate it that much more. So my, our colleagues in Sulacout have been working very hard to ensure that we all stay connected and up to date on COVID-19 information. They have also worked hard to create guidelines that provide helpful advice on testing, self-isolation, and specifically for First Nations and treatment and transfer plans. They have also provided guidance in creating nursing station simulations which involves not only nurses and physicians, but cleaning staff, security guards, x-ray techs, admin assistants, and even police officers. And in EFN, we actually conducted our own mini uh, simulation on Monday, which provided amazing feedback. It was just very, very good. Um, and at the EFN level, again, as we discussed since April 6th, we were having regular morning huddles, as we call them. Um, where multiple parties come, come together to discuss the COVID-19 related matters and how they affect EFN. So these team members come from uh, the community's own emergency response team, the band council, the health director, along with the health and social services, the nursing station staff, our nursing colleagues, our regional public health physician, like Dr. Bocking, and the staff from SLIFNA as well as ISK. Um, I want to stress the importance of all these organizations and people because COVID-19 obviously transcends health concerns and affects every aspect of community life. And these meetings have been a place for us to support one another and bring questions or concerns. Um, and it's like a clearinghouse. And it's amazing that from all these different silos, we have been able to form this team. And I just want to also give shout outs to our regional partners like Matawa Tribal Council, Nishinaabe Oski Nation, ISK, Cliftonist Counseling Program, Noden, and from elders from different communities who have just stepped up um, and have come on the radio shows to talk about those difficult uh, topics like advanced care planning and funeral um, restrictions. And I'm also grateful for the specialist report or support from Thunder Bay 
um, especially the psychiatrist I'm thinking of who is very resourceful and flexible with logistical difficulties. And I'm sure there's other people that I'm forgetting. I feel like this is turning into an Oscar speech, but we are just so thankful. <laughs> and, um, and of course, um, I couldn't do this without help and guidance of one of my first preceptors and mentors, Claudette, who has graciously delayed her retirement because of her commitment to the community. So I want to personally thank her <laughs> and recognize her for that. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Neckaway and Dr. Chase. You really brought to life um, a remote First Nation and the people um, and the stories behind those statistics that, you know, we talk about so much or we hear in the media. So thank you very much and very interesting to hear about the uh, creative ways you've overcome some of the challenges. Um, we do have a couple of questions, but before we um, before I ask those of you, and they came in through the chat, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kona Williams, who will be offering her reflections. She, uh, Dr. Williams is a forensic pathologist at Health Sciences North in Sudbury. Her father is Cree from Peguis First Nation, and her mother is Mohawk from Ganawage. Dr. Williams is also an assistant professor at NOSM, and she'll, and, oh, and um, anyway, uh, go, go ahead, Dr. Uh, Williams. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, and I just wanna say a big thank you to Dr. Neckaway and Dr. Chase for sharing your experiences and your knowledge. Um, I, I do wanna echo that there's so many challenges that you both brought to light that individuals in Southern Ontario don't face and having just Moved recently from Toronto, I can certainly see uh, the differences, uh, especially highlighted with uh, this pandemic. Uh, what stood out for me was the logistical challenge of getting uh, COVID-19 swabs tested in a timely manner. I know the province has certain turnaround times that they would like to see, and given the geographical distances and the logistical challenges, really, of getting swabs to the appropriate testing facilities to get the results as quickly as possible that's i don't think that's really been addressed uh in southern ontario because uh, they're so used to just getting a swab and then you get it done in 24 hours and you have your answer whereas you know sometimes you may be looking at a week or two weeks uh depending on where you are in northern ontario and you're right whether or not those swabs are viable by the time they get to the testing facility is another big question so the value of these results, considering how long it might take to get to a testing site, and for those waiting in limbo, is just is huge. Um, so my question: How can we, how can we do better? How can better testing be supported uh, in remote communities? Not, you know, maybe not just COVID nineteen, because we're learning from this, but for future, how can we better support uh, testing for Indigenous communities so that families and individuals are not waiting days or weeks for testing that we take, you know, people take for granted in, in the South. Yeah, one miigwech. Well, it, one of the things is point of care testing, which we have struggled to get into the North. And in fact, um, the ISTAT, just to know what someone's potassium is that you're treating with insulin um, for, for um, DKA, and you'd like to know what their potassium is, and we, we've had that for two years. That technology has been around for so long. We, uh, for INR testing, I, I did a locum in BC 20 years ago, and people there were doing point of care testing in their communities, and we couldn't get it in the north. So, so point of care testing is huge, and um, I realize nowhere has that for COVID now, but I think what immediately should have been part of the planning for the whole province was how do we get swabs from remote areas in a timely fashion. Now, again, this is the advantage to having local advocates is Dr. Bocking got in touch with the lab in Winnipeg and was able, the national lab, 
and was able to negotiate that a certain number of the ones from the northern communities, not all of them because they didn't have space, could be sent to them. So, in fact, this first case, we got the result back in five days because it had gone to Winnipeg, which was a remarkably short period of time. And also because his swab was done on a Sunday, it, accidentally there was a plane that came in on on a Monday. So we got everything, you know, it wasn't by design, it was by accident. <laughs> it got back so quickly. So that that would be my response, Becky. I don't know if you'd want to add to that. Um, one thing that has recently come up um, is um, I get the, because I did a locum at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Science Center. So I get their um, up-to-date um, memos. And one thing that was a concern to me, which I'm trying to still get an answer on, is their priority in-house COVID-19 testing swaps, um, where they had previously said they would extend those to patients leaving the hospital and then going back to remote First Nation communities, including long-term care homes and other high-risk areas. But they recently removed the First Nation patients from that criteria. So I'm asking to, for them to try to reconsider and put that back on, because as we know, there was a recent out or there was a recent patient who was an inpatient, left the hospital, came back with COVID-19 tests, and then that made 40 nurses go off on um, go off to self-isolate. So there is still a high risk of our patients in hospital um, contracting it. Um, inadvertently. So, um, I would ask everyone here to email Dr. Stuart, Dr. Stuart Kennedy or Dr. Zaki Ahmed to ask that it be put back on as a priority for in-house testing. Thank you, uh, Claudette and Becky. I do have three questions and hopefully we can get to all of them. So, the first one is a quick, should be a quick one. Um, do you know if there's an update on that housing request? If uh, what the if there has been any response? I can I personally cannot speak to that response. No, I haven't heard any updates. Okay, I can say that that COVID is being used as an an excuse. It hasn't been an excuse for the last four hundred years of colonialism, but. It's conveniently an excuse now that nothing can be done about that. I did ask at a provincial table yesterday where they asked us anything they could do to help with COVID. And I said, well, according to the chief of the community I serve, they need is it 82 or 83 new houses. That would be a huge help. But the, she didn't think they had funding. <laughs> wow. Thank you. And the second question is, um, would you be able to share the process that you went through to transfer the um, authority from Indigenous Services Canada to Sioux Lookout? If you can, I'm, I'm not sure what venue that could be shared in, but uh, there is somebody interested in that. And um, the third question is, uh, what strategies did you use um, for those or for reluctance for testing? We have about a minute. <laughs> so for the first part, um, that again was the remarkable work of our colleague, Dr. Hawking. And um, it would be, and we would be happy to help assist any other communities with that. Um, and they could get in touch with myself or Dr. Bocking and we could definitely arrange that um, transfer of knowledge there. Again, can't speak to that higher level process. But it's only for my understanding for on reserve First Nations because it's a transfer of authority from Health Canada, who is responsible for on reserve public health, whereas the province is responsible for everywhere else. So I don't know that they have that transfer from the provincial for the road access. That would be again something for for Dr. Balking. In terms of reluctance for testing, in fact, we've had more 
people wanting to be tested and where we've had to do a lot of work on the radio shows is explaining particularly the first test, which was not the high sen highly sensitive one, that the percentage of it being wrong and you know a false negative. And we spent a lot of time saying to people, the public health measures are what matters. Testing is important for overall decisions, but for your individual decision of whether to self-isolate if you've been out of the community, the test won't change it. You're still in isolation for two weeks because the test 30, what was it, 30% of them could be um, false negatives. And so a lot, so we, I, when I've asked for a test, just about everyone said yes. There's one person who has a long history, had a traumatic experience at the nursing station 30 years ago only recently has been coming back. And I was talking to her yesterday about getting one and she wasn't sure she could have it done. And I left it totally in her court to say yes or no when the nurses offered it. Um, to comment on that last bit, sometimes it's just logistics, as in like um, someone needs childcare, can't come in for that swap. It's just like with any of our appointments, why there are no shows. And so the nurses have been, um, and the community have been very creative and they have even done drive-by tests and they have gone to the homes because as you know, the, the community is not very large. So they're able to um, go and get these tests done on site for patients, which has helped. Thank you. I'll, I'll turn it back to James to close up. Thanks so much, Laura Lee. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Chase. Thanks so much, Dr. Neckway and Dr. Williams. It was great that everyone could join us today for uh, COVID-19 rounds. Really appreciate if everyone who's been online, if you could fill out an evaluation, uh, which will take all of three minutes and it's on our website. Uh, for healthcare professionals who would like a certificate to uh, acknowledge their attendance, there's a link to fill out. Uh, we hope all of you can join us again in one week when COVID-19 rounds will be exploring women's health, obstetrical and gynecological care in the North, and our featured presenters will be Drs. Jennifer Jocko and, and Karen Splinter. As always, please stay safe and please continue social distancing in your community. COVID-19 will be with us for a long time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your attention. And again, thank you for our presenters. See you back in one week with NOSM's clinical COVID-19 rounds. Bye then.